Thank you very much. This is Kadri. Uh, and I have today Lucy from our uh, enterprise architecture team. And we have a group of Microsoft people here that you can reach out and check with us, discuss with us. Uh, and I want to change the gears a little bit. And let me click this. And then talk a little bit about how we can implement this interoperability. I mean, you have seen the interoper interoperability uh, applications itself. And I think there are a couple of things that, that we need to do to enable those uh, interoperabilities, uh, interoperabilities in, in, in scale. So that's what I'm going to talk about and give a couple of examples on how that works, how we think. Uh, I think it's a, I would see the presentation here as a, as a good discussion starter. Um, and then we can, we can continue the, the, the conversation within the OSTU community on, on how we can enable that. Um, so I think like what we want to talk about interoperability today is, is one is uh, the OSTU platform, data platform is really extensible. So one of the things that, that you might have seen during the presentation today is, is one, like if you look into the, whether the foundational platform or whether you see the data platform, how we liberate data, how we make it high quality data, how we make it accessible, uh, that part is pre, is, 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 it's very mature, that, that's what we see. So, uh, and, and we're ready to deliver on that front. I think what comes um, out is, is a couple of things. So one is interoperability. So interoperability is what we're going to talk about today. Interoperability is about enabling different applications to read and write the same data that sits on uh, ADMI and OSTU. Uh, but probably more important than, than that, what comes out is we've been asked over and over again like around the workflows, enabling the workflows. So uh, enabling the workflows that includes multiple applications, different data, data types, and maybe tools in between uh, to enable the, the work that you do uh, on the OSTU environment. So, what we've seen is, and as you have seen in the last two sessions, and you're going to see on other sessions, the OST platform is extendable enough to enable those use cases. But I think what we need to do is to, to automate these and provide the right tools and right uh, frameworks within the OSTU uh, community. Um, the other thing that's important is I think we all uh, need to look into this together. Just the OSTU forum will not be able to scale with all of these extensibilities, so probably what what we should do is we should put the, um, the standards of how to build these extensibility and how to certify it, how to validate it. Um, then we can, we can work with the whole community here and, and even people outside of this community to build those extensions that will, uh, that will work with the platform. Um, and it will be driven by well-defined and verifiable extensibility. What that, what that means is there was a conversation today in, in, in today's morning's workshop was around uh, how can we build those extensibilities uh, and then extensions and then how can, how can we verify them. That was one of the things that we were discussing and that was one of the outcomes, uh, that part of the planning. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. I mean, that's, uh, that's gonna be important. Uh, and what I'm gonna also talk lastly is, is the different modes of extensibility. So I'm gonna give an example from the, uh, from the world of building drivers for the, for the, uh, for the operating systems. Uh, so following a similar model, we might have different modes of extensibility and that's also a kind of a thought provoking uh, idea on how we, can, how we can position these different uh, extensibility points. Um, so let me, let me start with, with that idea. So in, in the operating system world, we used to have this user mode and kernel mode kind of uh, device drivers and, and, and sometimes applications. And, and, and the main difference is uh, in, in the kernel mode, it runs directly as part of the or Windows uh, or, or with the operating system processes. But then the, the, the caveat is, of course, like some, in some cases, you have to build the device drivers or, or other extensions in this way because it, it needs to perform. But of course, the, the caveat is if something happens with that, it can bring down the whole operating system. So you will see the, the kernel panic and all these kind of uh, messages uh, or, the, or the blue screens. Uh, the other option is to build the, the, the extensions on the user mode. And when you build it in the user mode, it's, it's basically if, it, if the process dies, it dies and it doesn't affect the, the OS. Of course, the caveat is if you need these high performance kind of uh, extensibilities, then it, it, it's not, it might not deliver the, the performance in that. So following that same model, 
uh, we can basically look into the, the OSTU uh, physical architecture. And then you can see like there is these extent, ex, uh, external APIs with, with OSTU where you can, you can basically build applications and extensions and you can build SDKs. Uh, so that's, that's kind of like equivalent of the user mode. Right, so it's an external API and you can easily build it. It's very easy to test that. It really doesn't affect the system. But then there is the, there is the other thing which you see with the red box, which runs in the, in the OSTU itself. So that's the equivalent of like a kernel mode. But in some cases you have to do it. Uh, and there are some, some, some of these that, that we have done. Uh, so let me, let me show an example. Uh, okay. So let, let me show an example. I, I think I, I uh, if I remember, I put the video, but anyway, so uh, like seismic DDMS. So there was a good video in, in the previous session that you have seen, uh, which was kind of st just streaming the seismic data on Petrel directly from the, from the OSTU. So that, that's a good, good example of, of, uh, of a, a kernel mode or an OSTU integrated uh, DDMS. So it uses seismic DDMS. Uh, as, as the backend, and it has to be as part of the uh, OSTU itself, because if you run it outside of OSTU, it might not perform. Uh, so we're looking at these kind of extensions, and these kind of extensions we will have, like the Reservoir DMS was, was another one. There's other OSTU integrated extensions that we need to develop over time uh, because of certain reasons, and, and, and I think the main is the performance, the other one could be certain functions and features. So, this is, this is more critical, as I said, I mean, this, this kind of extension, if you build it as part of OSTU, if you put it in the OSTU, it can bring down the whole system. So that's why these, these kind of extensions needs to be a little bit more, um, uh, uh, I would say, validated, certified, and, and that kind of stuff. The second one, the second example I want to give is the, is the Power BI extension, the Power BI connector. So this is, this is a good example of, of uh, um, of user mode extension or, or extension that goes out. Because basically at the end of the day, at the back end, it uses the, the query API. And the query API goes to OSTU, queries the, the data, gets it back, and, and presents, presents it in a, in a Power BI dashboard. So that's a good example of, of what, we, what we have. And these kind of extensions or these kind of extensibilities is, is probably easier uh, because like it just uses the external APIs and you, there is no there is no risk of bringing down the whole OST infrastructure. Uh, so that's that's that example. Um, let me talk a little bit about the extensibility enablers here, uh, which is uh, like if you look into the to the OSTU, the, the Azure Data Manager for Energy in Between. Uh, so there are there certain touch points where we read and write data from from this. Uh, from, from the OSTU. And if you look into the SDK on the top, uh, like our, our colleagues in Equinor has developed an SDK uh, for, for Python that, that sits on uh, GitHub. Um, you, can, you can find that. Uh, but that's a, that's a great example of that SDK. And within the OSTU community, we're building a similar uh, SDK for reading and writing data directly from the OSTU. Uh, so there could be other SDKs, like the one on the left, you see the Power BI connector. That's considered as an SDK. I mean, like with, with Power BI connectivity, you can write uh, M language extensibility to read and write data from the OSTU. And, and there might be others that, that will be uh, developed. So uh, on the bottom, there's the extensibility and customization. So we can potentially consider an SDK uh, to build the, the kernel mode extensions uh, to, 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 to run those, uh, those extensions within, within the OSTU itself. Or there might be certain SDKs for data governance, so you, so you can think, consider doing plugins for enrichment or data quality or uh, AI-based uh, document attribute extraction, whatever. So that's also a good point. And within OSU, we have the notification service. So the, notif the notification service, you can catch if, if a certain new data type is ingested, and you can go and process it. So that's, a, that's another point that we're looking at. And, and the other one you see here, on the right, which is, which is, I think, we were having a discussion today morning is around uh, how do we do analytics with the platform. So there are certain questions with OSTU, which I, we don't have an answer now, but, but one is how do you get the data sitting in OSTU and, and expose it without copying it 
so that you can do AI, uh, machine learning, the large language models, whatever, uh, to, do, uh, to do that kind of stuff on it. And the other thing like with that SDK is you have to still uh, cover the, the entitlements and obliga obligation policies. You shouldn't just copy data so that people can read and write around that. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, to be able to drive all of this, we should be looking into an, an, a certification or a validation for interoperability. Again, it, one of the things that we were discussing uh, previous to this week was, was around uh, so, so how do we test these? I mean, how do we test an application, or how do we test an extension? Uh, and there are, here, there are some examples here, like the, the one on the on the left hand side. You see, it's from uh, Microsoft Azure Marketplace policy. So, basically, you have a policy engine, and then there are certain extensions, like there are extensions for SharePoint, extensions for Power BI, uh, and then you you build this, this policy, there are some basic things like does it have a name, does it have a logo, that kind of stuff, or it has some specific application, specific validation and test routines as part of the policy engine. So you can put it in a VM, you can run some uh, security testing on the VM, some cyber security um, kind of testing, and then, and then come up with some results. So and then the, the other examples you see here is like testing Petra plugins, uh, and then there is also one like with, uh, you can, it's called Windows Hardware Lab Kit, which is like you can run a driver and then test it on it. But, but to be able to do this kind of thing, you have to have a reference implementation that we, dis that we discussed, and then you, on that reference implementation, you have to have some test data, and within that test data, you should be able to test the scripts uh, on, on how you test those. As I, as I said, the, the, the external one, uh, the user mode testing is, is relatively easier, uh, but the kernel mode one is probably more complicated uh, in that sense. And with that, I want to give the floor to my colleague, Lucy. She's just done a, a new extensibility, uh, a, a kernel mode extensibility uh, exercise. Uh, yep. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lucy Liu. I'm a principal software engineer in Microsoft Cloud for Industry Energy Division. I'm very happy today to present some example, real world example, to showcase the interoperability of admin and external customer applications. So, um, since this work we just completed uh, not long ago, very recent, so we didn't have the opportunity to upload any uh, PowerPoint slide to, for this presentation yet, so I'm not going to have a PowerPoint slide to show here. So just to talk about some highlights about this work. So first of all, uh, what is OpenWorks? Many, as many of you may already know, OpenWorks is an important component of the Halliburton uh, Landmark Decision Space Software Suite. It supports complex and cross-domain workflow requirements. So recently, Halliburton has collaborated with Microsoft and successfully tested the interoperability between OpenWorks and uh, Microsoft Admi. So the test was done on a customized version of Admi in public preview. So the high-level workflow of the interactions between the uh, ADMI and uh, OpenWorks is as follows. So the business data of various domain entities stay within the OpenWorks data management system. And then the metadata are uh, crawled into the ADMI instance to enable easy discovery of the business data using the standard unified uh, OSDU uh, uh, APIs. And then the URL retrieval instructions for those business data can then be generated by data set service. And then those uh, generated URL retrieval instructions can then be used by any client apps to retrieve the business data from the OpenWorks data management system. So that completes the whole workflow between the ADMI and OpenWorks data management system. So through the interoperability and extensibility of the admin. So yeah, that wraps up this um, uh, working example of the interoperability. Thank you, and with that, I think 
we want to open up for questions if we have time. Um, we probably best in the interest of time to allow the other two okay. presenters. So I'd suggest any any questions, please uh, yep. go with Kadri and uh, Lucy. We're around, and and I think like it will be further discussions. Thanks. Excellent.